to Israel this week? No, seriously. Yeah. Garden tour. Yes, thank you. It is beautiful. All right. Um, I need to see your guide because you all have earphones and I want a microphone. <laughs> Please come on up here this oh, way. What's his name? Is Brian? Nibby or Nibby? Nibby. Nibby. Uh, sure. I'm from Romania. I'm your guide today, and uh, uh, we are honored that you chose to have the Garden Tomb as part of your uh, mm -hmm. tour here to Israel. Has anyone been here before? A couple of you have been here. Wonderful. All right. The Garden Tomb Association was founded in 1894 as a nonprofit organization. It was founded by people who believe that the Golgotha, or Skull Hill, was the Golgotha mentioned in the New Testament, and the tomb that was discovered down here in 1867, that this was the tomb where Jesus was laid, uh, and on the third day rose from the dead. Now, we'll talk about all that. What we do, what I will tell you now, I can tell you with certainty, is everything you see here does agree to Scripture. Okay, we do not know exactly where he was crucified, now we'll talk about that. We do not know exactly if that is the tomb, and the reason why is you have to have a body, and as Christians, we believe Amen. Jesus rose from the no dead. Body. So therefore, there's no body. Reach. But uh, anyways, we'll talk about uh, everything. Hopefully, I'll take what was black and white on a page, turn into high-definition memories for you. And uh, I hope this is a, an edifying time, an encouraging time. I hope it will be a blessing for you. Uh, you have a very good spot for your meeting, right down next to the tomb, or what we call the cistern. There'll be a basket there, where since we're non-profit, there's no charge for anything. If you want to leave an offering, that is how we stay open. I am not paid for anything. I volunteer my time and come here like the other volunteers do. And uh, best best uh, job in the world, so to speak. I, I, I enjoy this, come for three months a year. And uh, thank you so much for coming. Let's go ahead and get started. If you'll just follow after me. All right, ladies and gentlemen, what you're looking at here in front of you is called Skull Hill. Now the question is, is this the Golgotha of the New Testament? Gol Golgotha means in Aramaic means skull. And in English we have the word Calvary, which comes from Calvary in Latin. And that also means skull. The Bible says in John 19, Jesus was brought to the place of his skull. So, why is it called Skull Hill? Why is it called the place of the skull? Nobody knows exactly for sure. There are three possibilities. Number one is we are seated in the old quarry of uh, King Solomon, uh, first temple period. They would have taken the, the rocks from this area, quarried them out, and brought them to the temple out and assembled the temple. Now because this was a quarry, uh, there were a lot of stones laying around, and therefore people were executed here at this hill. There were stones here, and uh, many also believe that the first martyr of the church, that was Stephen, was stoned in this area. And the reason for that, other than just the fact that this is known to be an area of, of stony, the churches in this area that are around here, would you like to guess who they're all named? St. Stephen. Stephen. Every single one of them in this area is named St. Stephen. Now, uh, that's a possibility because we're in a quarry. This was a known execution area, like a skull. Now you can see this picture taken in 1900. Can you see the skull here? Okay, it's obvious the two eyes, the nose, and the mouth. Now, when they built the bus station, they raised it to this level and covered about uh, 18 feet of the, of the hill. And uh, unfortunately, two and a half years ago, after a snowstorm, the bridge of the nose fell off. And that was right up there. See the, see the little pyramid of stones between the two eye holes in the middle of the hill? That is where the bridge of the nose was. Now, this was exposed for about 2,800 years. Plus, they were doing construction on top of the hill in the Muslim cemetery, and they were pounding down uh, and making holes in the rock and uh, with a big jackhammer to, to put uh, supports for the crypts, and all the vibration, vibration, nose fell off. It is what it is. That's the way it is. Life goes on. The mountain no longer has a nose. Uh, but that doesn't change the fact that this was Skull Hill. Uh, third reason is the color of the stone. You see what color that is. It's white. What color is the skull? The skull is white. So we have three possibilities. They work together to give you an idea that this is Skull Hill. But the question is, is this the Golgotha of the New Testament? Well, if we're going to use the Bible as the final authority, then we need to go to Scripture and find out what the Bible has to say. First of all, uh, if you want a strictly biblical reference, Jesus was called the Passover Lamb. He did die at Passover. Uh, he was The Passover Lamb was a sacrifice for sin. Now, uh, the sacrifice for sin, according to Leviticus 1.11, had to be killed in a certain direction from the altar. 
had to be killed on the north side of the altar. We just happened to be north of the of the temple, which puts us north of the altar. Uh, that's a possibility of, 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 of the direction, but you know, this is something to consider. If you want things that are more practical that you can put your hands on or see, Hebrews says Jesus suffered outside the gates where the wall is today, on top of the cliff face, which is the other side of the quarry over there. That is where the wall was 2,000 years ago, in 30 AD, outside the gates. Those are two things. Number three, John 19, Jesus went out into a place called the place of a skull. The place of a skull. The place of a skull denotes a large area. Probably from the Damascus Road and over to this direction to where now Herod's Gate is. That's about 500 meters or so, give or take. And then about 100 and some meters this direction. So it's a large area. The Bible says in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. Meaning the place, what? In the place of the skull, there was a garden. Someone had a garden in what was referred to as the place of the skull. 25 meters from us right over here was the start of a garden. We are seated right here. And so the garden began right here. All right, so. We're near a garden, we're north of the altar, we're outside the gates, we're at a place of skull, large area. Anything more specific? Yes, excuse me, I have to clean my glasses because all of a sudden I had a spot and I can see it. <laughs> all right, there we go, excuse me, put my eyes back on. Now, uh, the Bible says that Jesus was crucified along a road. It does, yes. People passed by, and you know what they did? mocked him and laughed at him. He said he was the king of the Jews. If he comes down from the cross, then we'll believe him. Ha, 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 on their way. Rome crucified people along major roads. Why? It was a deterrent. Do you know the state of the prisoner, of the man that was being executed, the condemned person? They were stripped of their clothing. They were scourged. Many times they died from the scourging. They were then nailed to a cross and dropped in a hole next to a major thoroughfare. There were two of them in the place of the skull. Jericho Road came right out here where Suleiman Street is, right where about where this road is. Major Road east-west, Jericho to Joppa, okay? Damascus Gate, the Damascus Road, went north into Damascus, Syria. In the place of the skull, two major roads, north of the altar, uh, uh, next to a garden. Okay, all of these things point to a direction. So if this is Golgotha, where do you think the crosses were? I know every movie, every calendar you buy at a Christian bookstore, every picture somebody paints shows three crosses on top of a hill that looks like a skull. I'm sorry to, to tell you, but there were no crosses on top of that hill ever. Why? Well, I should say ever. Probably not ever, but uh, that Jesus wasn't crucified up there because there were no roads up there. That was not major thoroughfare. That was the middle of nowhere. Okay, where were the crosses then? Well, if this is Golgotha, they were along the road with the skull in the background, puts them underneath the bus stop or one of these buildings. You say, oh really? Well, why? How come nobody ever looked at it? The level of the ground at the time of Jesus in this area right here was 22 feet below the ground level now. So when you walk around Jerusalem, that's not the Jerusalem of Jesus' time. This is the Jerusalem a whole lot later. Everything from Jesus' time was a whole lot under your feet. You can see it. Go in the old city, look at these holes, and you see the excavations down in the first temple period, 35, 40 feet below the surface. What happened? Well, Jerusalem has been destroyed and rebuilt about 18, 17, 18 times. And it rains dirt here. Did you know that? We have to come out every morning and clean. And, and it just there's it just dust everywhere because we're on the edge of the desert and things begin to build up. So the time of Jesus is about seven meters below us. So nobody knows exactly where it is. I've had some people get upset with me. Say, I came to see the cross. Well, I want to see exactly where the cross was. Well, folks, nobody knows exactly where it was. So therefore the question is, is why then do people come here? They come here because of what it represents. What is Golgotha? Is it the ugliest hill in Jerusalem next to a smelly bus station? Take Jesus out of the story, that's all you have. Put Jesus in the story and you have what? You have an event. The event is the crucifixion of the Son of Man, the Son of God, who left heaven, came to earth, gave, laid down his life, shed his blood as the Passover lamb, so God the Father would be satisfied that sin was paid for and we could have a way back to God the Father through the work of Jesus Christ, which is dying, being buried, and rising again. Amen. Golgotha, ladies and gentlemen, is something that happens. It's a place of remembrance. 
What did Jesus say the night before he was crucified? He celebrated the Passover with his disciples. He took the bread and the cup. His office. You eat this bread, drink this bread. <coughs> Do this in remembrance of me. Ladies and gentlemen, this place remembrance. When he died on the cross, what did he say? Hebrews says, consider Jesus the author and the finisher of the faith. He cried out, it is finished. Paid in full. Transaction has been settled with his blood. Jesus covered all the sins that were ever committed and made the way possible for us to be born again. It's a place of forgiveness. It's a place of love. It's what did Jesus say when they nailed him to the cross? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Golgotha is a lot of things. You could sit here and start naming things what Jesus did. It's a place of remembrance. Jesus wanted us to remember his sacrifice and the shedding of his blood. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what Golgotha is. Take him out of the story. This is the ugliest place in all of Jerusalem. It stinks, too. So it's not even a good tourist place. You put Jesus back in the story, and you have something of great importance to and, and the plea consider Jesus. Whether you have received him or have not received him, Golgotha is the place where Jesus Christ paid for our sin and made the way back for us to have peace with God the Father. That is Golgotha. On top of the hill today is a Jewish, uh, Jewish excuse me, I'm sorry, is a Muslim cemetery. I don't know where that came from. Uh, it is a thousand years old. It's a Mujahideen cemetery. Uh, it just goes back to the Crusades. Do you have any questions? I'm adding to your information overload here. So, any questions? Okay. Please, uh, take a picture. The, the, what's left of the skull is over here on the right. If you come back again, it might look different. Yes, the United States, if you have a handle. I saw a hand in parts yeah. of the door. Please, come take a picture. I'm going to wait for you down here. Yes, ma'am? What are the words up there? What does it say? Yeah. The signs are in Arabic. The one on the left says Makbaret. Uh, Al Mujahideen, something like that. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce it properly. Al Islamiyye, which says uh, Mujahideen uh, Islamic Cemetery. Mm -hmm. The one on the right says in Arabic. Uh, well, it's what they say three times when they convert to Islam, so I'll just tell you in English. It says uh, Allah is God and Muhammad is the prophet of God. Say, why is it there? This is East Jerusalem, that's the Muslim Cemetery. That's the one there. It's not our hill. <laughs> Right. This is what it used to look like. How'd it go? The seeds and then ruin the juice. Uh, so they take their shoes off and tread the grapes. Okay, you ever watch Lucille Ball and Ethel? Yes. The whole world has seen that. I could ask a, a group from, you know, from the Philippines who speak Tagalog. Have you seen? Oh, yes, Lucy, we know. That. <laughs> Everybody understands that one. So that is my go to illustration. Everybody knows Lucy. So, anyways, that is an example uh, of a first century wine press. There was a garden here 2,000 years ago. Now, if we are to continue on with the Bible as our final authority, what are we looking at? Well, this tomb here was discovered in 1867. This is the tomb down here in the, in the hole down here next to the rock. Like this right here. It was a stone bench tomb, a large tomb, a private tomb. Two types of tombs in the first century. I make mention of this because uh, uh, this is the type the Bible describes right here. Now a typical tomb was the tomb Lazarus was buried in from Bethany. You know the man Jesus raised from the dead on the fourth day, which was a messianic miracle. You'll come down here and you'll see a hole in this tomb called a nephesh. That was a soul or spirit. The Jewish uh, belief was that the soul or spirit hung around the body for three days. After that, there was no way to revive the body. So Jesus waiting around to the fourth day and raising him from the dead showed he was Messiah. It was a messianic miracle, the last one he did uh, just before uh, he came into Jerusalem and then was crucified. So, uh, so uh, Jesus was not buried in a common tomb because that was a cave. So let's assume we're sitting in a cave here. Now on the walls, you would have crypts dug into the wall about that high, that wide, and about eight to 10 feet deep. They wrapped the bodies and anointed them because could you imagine 30 decomposing bodies in one of these things? That's why they anointed them and they slid them into the, to the crypts and they waited a year. After a year, someone in the family went back, pulled, unwrapped the bodies, 
took them out and put the bones in what's called an ossuary, which is a bone box. Now, a Bible reference to this, you may say, does the Bible speak of that? Yes, it does. There was a young man that went to Jesus and he said, I want to follow you, but you know, I really can't. Please let me bury my father first. He was asking for an excuse not to follow Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, let the dead bury the dead. Oh, Jesus, why are you being so mean to the poor guy? He wasn't. The guy's father had already died, was in, a, in one of these cave tombs, and he was saying, I have to wait till his body decomposes so I can take his bones out and put them on the box, and then I'll follow you. Jesus was not impressed with that excuse, and he rebuked him, so let the dead bury the dead. And the man did not follow Jesus. He went, he went back away. So that was the custom at the time. So when Jesus had the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, Joseph was not giving up his tomb. He was loaning it to the family of Jesus. Because after a year, then someone in the family, maybe even Joseph, because Joseph believed in Jesus, would have taken his bones out and put them in a box. Because folks, remember, ain't nobody waiting for Sunday morning. <laughs> There's a famous sermon by, a, by an old preacher in the United States named S.M. Lockridge. It's called, it's Friday, Sunday's a couple. You want to know what? Ain't nobody waiting for Sunday morning. There was nobody. Say, what do you mean? They believed in Jesus, yes, and they were devastated when he died. I have to admit, I have to admit, I have to imagine they were probably pretty angry and discouraged and just destroyed. Sunday morning, when the ladies were on their way to the tomb, they were going to embalm him. They weren't going there to see an, a, a stone rolled away. No, 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 no. This tomb here is described in scripture. It's in a garden next to the place of the skull, cut out of the rock. This was chiseled from stone. Very hard work, because that stone is really, really tough. It's very hard. And, and, and uh, therefore, it is a tomb of a wealthy man. It was a private tomb. All right? Number five, Mark 16, verse number five says that uh, they looked inside the tomb Sunday morning and they saw a young man seated on the right side. This tomb has a burial on the right side. That's a Bible detail. That is not extraordinary, but it is unusual. Not all the tombs were like this. Most of them were turned this direction. You walk in on the end, you have the antechamber where they prepared the body, and you go to the burial place in the back. This one's on the side, just like the Bible says. That's very interesting. Now, the Bible says uh, that the door was a short door. This tomb had a three-foot high door. So how do you know it was short? Because Mary Magdalene and John both had to stoop down to look inside. About a three-foot high door. Now it's taller because of an earthquake, but it was about there. The Bible says that the, the tomb where Jesus was laid had a rolling stone door in front of it. Now, uh, that's unusual, but that was also common at the same time. What was unusual was the size of the stone. Nobody ever found the stone, but the Bible calls it a very great stone. What is great? Well, there's a, we have an example of a stone down there about this tall. It's a little one from Ai. It's an actual burial stone. The estimated size, based on the size of the tomb and the track and the door here, is my size. Okay? With my hat, I'm six foot seven. Okay? <laughs> and uh, imagine me as a big circle, about two meters tall, about, uh, about eight to nine, eight, eight inches thick, nine inches thick. Uh, 2,000 kilograms, that's two metric tons, or 4,400 pounds. So sa Sunday morning, we got about six ladies going to the tomb. They love Jesus, they're gonna anoint him again, or do it, they bought spices. I don't know if they knew it, well, my, my wife says they were, they were women, and they were gonna fix what the men did and do it right. <laughs> we don't know why, but they wanted to pay their respects. They love Jesus. These, you can imagine they're walking to the tomb, and what are they talking about? Man, there's a stone in front of that door. Who's going to roll that stone away? One, two, three, four, five, six. We have seven ladies here. Okay, we'll include you over here with the camera. Eight. <laughs> how far, if I give, if I give you a two-ton rolling stone, how far is that thing going to go with the eight of them? Yeah. Not. It's, it's going to sit there, and you're just going to take pictures next week, right? <laughs> now, it took 12 men with tools to move one of those things. Or one angel. Matthew 28, 2, the angel of the Lord descended, rolled the stone away, sat on it, and spoke with him. Said to the ladies, why do you seek the living among the dead? There's another detail. Around this tomb were 700 other tombs. You can't see them because they are in the catacombs behind them. 
There's one on the left, there's one on the, uh, behind him. When you're inside the tomb, you'll be about that far from another tomb that you get to from the catacombs in another area. It's another detail from scripture. Why do you see the living amongst the dead? Now, well, ladies and gentlemen, that was good news. He wasn't there. The soldiers were gone. The stone was rolled away. And the, the guy said, come see the place where you, the Lord laid. Wow, let's go tell the disciples. They go tell the disciples and the response is, <laughs> exactly, yeah, right. <laughs> what were you, I almost said something I shouldn't have. What were you doing? Dreaming that up. Yeah, when, when, when I heard that statement. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Idle talk. Well, Peter and John wanted to check it out. They run to the tomb. Bible says John got there first, but he stopped at the door, looked inside, saw the grave clothes laid out. If this is the tomb, this is the place where he was laid. That's the only one you can see. Ladies and gentlemen, the face cloth was folded and placed to the side. Now, if you think somebody stole from the body, why in the world will they unwrap a crucified body, for goodness sakes, and then fold the face cloth? That doesn't make one ounce of sense. Now, we don't know. I don't know what was in John's head. Remember, he was at the foot of the cross. He was there the whole time. He loved Jesus. He's a big man. He's a fisherman, estimated to be a six foot five, six foot six, 250 pounds. He's huge. That's what history says. Big guy, son of thunder. Talked and then thought. I mean, he's a big man. But he loved Jesus. You know what the Bible says about him? When he saw that, he believed. John believed because of the evidence of the resurrection. Romans 1 4, Jesus Christ was all power declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. Ladies and gentlemen, that is what this garden represents. I'll get to that in just a second. He left Mary Magdalene stayed. The Bible says she was weeping. Why? She wasn't convinced yet. She stooped down and looked inside and saw two angels, one seated at the head and one at the feet. That indicates the size of the tomb. If the, if the burial place was two feet high, two feet wide, and ten feet deep, how do you sit at the head and the feet of where the body laid? You don't. It was not a cave tomb. No, 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 no. It was a large private tomb, exactly like the one down here. So what do we have here? We have a visual representation, illustration of the three pillars of the gospel. Golgotha is the death a garden in a tomb is a burial, an empty tomb is the resurrection. The gospel of Jesus Christ, according to the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Nowhere else in the world can you see that but where you sit today. That's what this garden represents. Jesus Christ, crucified, buried, and he's not there, he rose again. He was crucified between two men that both laughed and mocked at him, mocked him. One of them changed his mind and said to the first thief, you not fear God. That's kind of ironic because the other guy was laughing at Jesus earlier. Now he says to the other guy, you not fear God. This man's done nothing wrong. We deserve this death. And he said to Jesus, when you enter your kingdom, remember me. And Jesus said what? Today. He said, you'll be with me in paradise. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the gospel. Apostle Paul wrote of that many years later in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Apostle John, who was there the whole time, wrote in John 1, 12, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that we believe on his name. Ladies and gentlemen, this garden is the gospel visually. That is what we have here. That is why it is special. That's why people come here to sing and worship. Why? It's not just a tourist place. Take Jesus out of the story. Smelly, ugly bus stop, homely hill, pretty garden, hole in the rock, and lots of people sitting around. <laughs> Put Jesus back in the story. The gospel of Jesus Christ illustrated in front of your eyes. And the plea, whosoever will, whosoever believes and receives, will receive eternal life. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Jesus did all the work, and He's the one who does all the saving, and that's what this card Let's go ahead and go down.
This was turned into a trough by the crusaders. They lowered a couple of wood at the post to look at. Their donkeys were tied up here. See this? The crusaders turned this. Look at this. Would you put a stone with a with a slant out on the outside? No. And you see, you can see the line here. See the line? This is how high it used to be. What they did is they lowered it and slanted it and turned this into a trough. And then they hooked their donkeys up here and fed them right here. The Crusaders, they, they were Catholic, so to them, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was a place. They used this as a stable for their animals during the Crusades. They totally changed the two. I say, the Crusaders, what do you do? Anyways. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, the, the symbol of Christianity today, there are two of them, a cross and a fish, right? And you know what it was 1,900 years ago? Well, it was a fish also, but there was something that was even before that. It's called an, it's an anchor. And it comes from Hebrews chapter number 6, verse 19. Jesus is the anchor for our soul. Okay, there are two, three, three that are known to exist in the world. It's an anchor with a cross built into an anchor. This particular one here has three anchors and a cross. Catacombs in Rome, dated to the 2nd century AD, 1,900 years ago. Church in Turkey in front of the tomb right here, right there. See this? Here's your cross. Here's anchor one. Here's anchor two. Here's anchor three. If this, is, if this is from the second century, like the one in the catacombs of Rome, the Christians were here 1,900 years ago, makes it the oldest uh, uh, known place of a Christian symbol in Jerusalem. Wow. Okay, that still exists. Obviously, first century, they were all here because the church started here, but there's no evidence of it anywhere. There's your only, that's as far as I know, the oldest evidence. I might be wrong, but as far as I know, that would be the oldest if it was put here in the second century. Does it prove this is the tomb of Jesus?